Welcome to the Military Wire Special Edition Vision 2020 Speaker Series, where we interview some of America's most elite men and women who have served this country. And we tell their stories in hopes that you, our listener and view, viewer, will gain a bit of insight, an aha moment that you can apply to your own life, uh, especially in these crazy times. And I've got some pretty amazing guests today. But before we get to that, I would just want to thank our sponsors, Bonefrog Sellers, who is founded by Navy SEAL Tim Cruikshank. And I had the proceeds of that wine go toward the families of fallen Navy SEALs. So be sure to check those guys out, Bonefrog Sellers. So here we are in the midst of a war, some will say, and I don't care if it's a physical combat operation war or if it's a war between the ears, if it's a mental war that you're having. And how do we get through that? And we're going to talk today and really unpack this whole issue of how do we develop both courage and mercy in times of conflict and uncertainty. And with me today, I have Robert Port, who is an Academy Award winning writer and director. So Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. Great to have you. And we've got the author of the book, Recon, uh, who is, it's a story about his dad, and it's based uh, on uh, his dad. And Richard, welcome to the show, Richard Bosch. Good to be here. Yeah, to great here. to have you both. So you're going to help me unpack this whole idea of courage uh, and mercy. Um, I just want to tell our listeners that I did get a preview of the movie Recon, and it is coming out November 10th, and we'll get to that as far as where you can find it, get it, etc., watch it, view it here in just a little bit. Um, but to preface this, the film is really based on World War II, and I want to give our listeners a bit of history uh, because that seems to be lost amongst some today. Uh, but World War II, it was a global conflict. Obviously, I think most people know that. It lasted from 1939 to 1945, and it involved the vast majority of the world's countries, uh, including all the great powers. And it formed two different opposing forces, which was the Allies and the Axis. It started when Germany invaded Poland, if you guys remember that. And then the U.S. got involved after December 7th, 1941, with the bombing of Pearl Harbor. What's interesting about World War II is unlike Vietnam, where the average age of the combat veteran was 19, in World War II, the average age of the combat veteran was 26. Many of these men left families behind. They were already married, had small children, and it was a totally different war. It was a pretty troubling war, and the conflict in the aftermath of that war was long lasting. Robert, I'm gonna to go to you first because you have done some pretty amazing films. Uh, you received an Academy Award for your film, uh, Twin Towers, which is about a New York City policeman who was killed during 9-11. Um, and now you have this military thriller, Recon, mm -hmm. uh, which we'll get into, but tell us, you know, tell us the sizzle reel version of this movie and what prompted you to pick this piece by Richard um, and share the story of these three service members. So I'll flip those, answer them out of order if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, I grew, I, <laughs> so I grew up, I grew up obviously children in the, in the 70s, World War II movies were prominent, uh, The Great Escape, Bridge Over the River Kwai, these were, these were movies that as a child I loved. I mean, you don't wanna love war movies, but of course as a young child, you see these epic films and, and you become enthralled by them. So if you take that and couple it with my grandfather who um, was part of the greatest generation, he escaped from, I'm Jewish, he escaped from Vienna when Hitler invaded um, when he was 16 escape literally he and his mm -hmm. folks left dinner on the table um, worked their way from france to london back to america eventually uh went back in his early 20s fought under Patton, uh, won a bronze star fought and brought battle the uh, bulge excuse me so i grew up utmost respect for the military and yeah. uh, my grandfather also would never talk about the war as many of those folks who would never ever ever discuss the war in fact if you ever called him a hero he would say i was just trying to survive i mean it's, it's so many of these men did and, and yeah. women, they, they would downplay it um, but what he did instill in me uh, was this tremendous sense of morality and, and, and how important morals were and how careful we, if we, would, we would be to repeat our mistakes if we didn't take cause to, to make some really important decisions in our life. Um, so sort of with all that, and that's the super quick reader side chest version, um, yeah. I wanted to do, I wanted to do a World War II movie. You know, I wanted to do my David Lee, my Spielberg, um, not that I could ever come close to those great auteurs, uh, but my film. And um, when I read a blurb 11 years ago, almost to the day in the New York Times book review back before we had iPads about Richard's incredible book. Um, and I read the opening paragraph about four soldiers, one day morality um, and how the crucible they were placed in and life and death. I knew I had to have this book. 
I, I, I bugged my agent every day for about 40 straight days. Every day I called him, you got to get the book. I'm working on it. You got to get the book, offer him more money, offer him more money. And that was 11 years ago. 11 years later, a long 11 years later, we finally got the film, the film made based on Richard's incredible, um, amazing book, which to me is really a story about how one individual uh, to, to take sort of the tagline from Schindler's List, which is a line from the, from the Talmud, not that I'm a rabbinical scholar, save a life, you save the world. That's what I took out of the book. And I, and I love that message and I love that story. Wow, that is so, so powerful. And obviously, you know, I have a strong connection with the Schindler name, obviously that being my last name. Uh, and there is a relation there for those yeah. who know me, they know that, but- um, Really? I'm, I'm very tied into this, uh, certainly wow. this period of time. Um, Robert, thank you for sharing that because it's so powerful. And I want, I want our people to understand why filmmakers make the films they do, uh, because oftentimes it isn't just about the money. It's really about the message. And I think it's really important having viewed this film that people understand the message that you're conveying in here. And I love that you summed it up that way. Richard, this, this film is based on your dad's experience in World War II. And, you know, to Robert's point, oftentimes, you know, uh, my grandfather never, ever talked about his experience in World War II. And so it struck me that, wow, you have a book on this, um, on your dad's experience. Um, you know, oftentimes that's not shared because out of concern for the family or to your point, Robert, that, you know, they never consider themselves heroes. Um, how was your father's experience shared with you? How, how did you get to, to write the book? Well, he, he told the basic story of it. Um, uh, of the novel, he told it as a funny story. Uh, I don't want to give away the end of the movie, but yeah, the end where this man is trying to get this other man to do something, and and he's not doing it. He's trying to let him go. My father used to tell it as the point of the story was how close he came to killing the guy because he wouldn't run. Um, mm. So. When he talked about, we never heard any of the bad stuff. What we heard was goofy stuff that happened. And he would tell those because he was a storyteller. He was quite, he was a hell of a storyteller. So he would tell a story like when his friend Tolly Miller felt sorry for this cat and put him inside his field jacket and the cat went crazy in there. And he described Tolly Miller rolling around in the road trying to get this cat out from him. Fetching him to death, you know? And he's screaming just as if he's been shot. <laughs> Things like that. Um, but um, some of what happened, um, the Washington uh, Times Herald printed an article about him uh, because he, he was saved by a German soldier Yeah. Um, at the end of, um, he'd been wounded and the soldier came and walked him back to the American lines and surrendered and it made the paper. Um, and I got him to talk about that a little bit, you know. Uh, but then it was just curiosity. You know, I was a kid, I was 18, 19 years old. He, the only time he told us the bad stuff was when my brother and my twin brother and I were talking about, you know, joining the army and going to fight in Vietnam. And he was, you don't want to carry a rifle in the mud, I'm telling you. And then he told us some of what he saw Hmm. what happened and then we got really curious about it and started pressing him on it when he died we found a bronze star and a silver cross and a, and a croix de guerre along with a purple heart in a little box that he put in the closet um we never wow. knew any of it you know we never knew what he did to get any of those things yeah we but um i added stuff to heighten the uh, tension and the sense of crisis with the whole thing. And um, had the basic bones of the story of the old man leading the boat over the mountain and coming back down. And then the uh, commanding person telling him to take him off in the woods and shoot him. Um, that basic thing was the story my father told. Mm. What was it like, Richard, to be raised, you know, once you started piecing everything together, what, what was your upbringing like? Was it, uh, 
I mean, the movie portrays, you know, obviously PTS issues and, and a few other things that, you know, certainly those of us who have served in uniform are very familiar with. But what was it like to be raised by your dad? He had, um, he came home, he, le he left six feet tall, 175 pounds, a pitcher who had real talent. I mean, um, uh, he was playing for a minor league baseball team and they were talking about sending him up to the big leagues. And then he developed a stubborn tendonitis in his right wrist and, and then Pearl Harbor and all that in the war. Um, but he, he came home from the war weighing 128 pounds Holy with smoke. a very severe case of, of uh, what they then called uh, battle fatigue um, or stress reaction syndrome was another name for it. But uh, um, as a father, he wanted us to be tough because he knew what was ahead for us as boys. So he was very direct and very um, devout. We were all devout. We said the rosary every night. Mm. Uh, he would lead us in it every night. But he, he was loving. He knew how to love. And um, so years and years later, I was in my 30s, um, my niece was marrying a guy we all knew to be badly into coke and all these other things but she was already pregnant by him and they were getting married and i was at the wedding and my father was there and i was leaning into this little grotto like space to have a drink of water the water fountain and i heard my father's voice son i want to talk to you and i turned and he was three quarters turned from me he couldn't see that i was right behind him and he put his finger in that boy's chest and he said, I've killed better men than you. And it went over me like a cold bath down the back of my neck that he was not speaking figuratively. Yeah. He had that. He had that experience inside him somewhere. Yeah. He had never given the slightest indication that any of it was there. And then he said, you understand, son, hardened German veterans with a history of violence. And you do anything to hurt this little girl, and it's going to be you and me. That kid turned as white as the walls. Wow. Yeah. So, so you knew after something like that what he'd seen. Yeah. But he never showed any sign. He was, if there was a restaurant on the Eastern Seaboard that he didn't know that served good food, I don't know what it was. <laughs> what, 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 do you what to drink, what to eat, you know, what to yeah. enjoy those things, books, all of it. It's, if it's, there was, Richard, if there was one thing that you would want people to know or learn or gain from your father's experience, from your dad's experience, what would it be? Oh, uh, I think to somehow find a way to keep your decency, no matter what happens. Mm. That the truest imaginative act is the act of mercy because it means one has imagined oneself into the body and mind of someone else who is at their mercy. And if they can, you can imagine this other person well enough, you can say, okay, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to let you go. Well, you know, that's and such that's a powerful message for today too. I think, uh, I think we all can, you know, learn from that. You know, I, I think, you know, the one thing that I saw through the film is circumstances certainly you know, our biases certainly help us interpret circumstances or hinder us from interpreting the circumstances correctly. For I mean, there's scenes in there that were very alarming, gave me flashbacks in some areas. Um, Robert, turning to you, you know, in war, there are times that to, you know, Richard's point, demand courage and mercy. What, what does this mean to you? I mean, you've kind of got this theme through the film a little bit, but how did you, how did you weave that golden thread? Well, it, it's something that I, in the movies that I loved growing up, I saw, but I never got to experience it. I grew up a very cushy life. I grew up in Scarsdale, New York, and I didn't want for anything. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to pretend. I mean, thank you for your service and Richard's service. I'm not going to pretend I had any of that. The one thing I did observe over and over was my grandfather up until the day he died, 80, I think 82 was his last fight. Uh, it was a, it was a cause of great humor for me and my brother. He mm. would routinely 
my dad would say, uh, you're going to love this one call, you know, and sure enough, and we'd see him at Sunday night dinner. He would say, what happened? Oh, it was nothing. What happened? Well, a, a UPS driver cut me off and, uh, you know, he called me these names and one thing led to another and I knocked them out. Or, uh, you know, for a man who was an atheist who believed religion was the downfall of mankind, he always wore high around his neck, the Hebrew letter for life. And the minute someone called him in any kind of name, um, the legendary story in the 50s, he, he knocked out two guys in Spain who were beating up a woman and they threw him in jail. Long story short, the, the American consulate got him out and said, never go back to Spain. So he, he had drawn this line and explained to us, no one ever takes anything from you. At the same time, mm. think of a time he left us that he didn't cry. So he, he had both those emotions. Now, with that said, when I came out to Los Angeles, I got a great opportunity to, uh, to work with the sheriff's department, both me and my brother. He's a doctor. He's their medical director. We, I did 10 years with the sheriff's department, sworn as a reserve deputy. And although I would not in any way, shape, or form say that that is the same thing as going to serve your country overseas, I was able to observe the camaraderie. A lot of these brave police officers and deputies do also serve in the reserves. I was able to really observe the camaraderie. In, in, and instead of just talking about heroics, I was able to witness it firsthand and see, to your point, I know this is a long way of answering it, I apologize, what real courage is. And I think one of the things that's so important today, and I said this, or tried to say this in an earlier interview, is real courage is, I got to serve alongside a, a, a great captain, Paul Petrie and Tony, who's retired now. And, um, you know, we, we served, we, we were in some really bad neighborhoods at the time. Uh, Compton was, was one of the murder capitals of the country. Most of the people, 99.9% .9 of the people in that city were good people who wanted to do the right thing and want to get home to their family and, and, and friends. And what Petey and his, his team were doing, and they were Muslim and they were Jewish and they were Christians and they were Catholics and they were atheists and agnostics. They all worked together, men and women, every yep. color and creed. Nobody ever was in judgment. And when the 911 call came in, no one ever said, well, what's the race, creed, color, religion of the individual on the other side of the line? They go through that door and, and, they, and they do the job that they're supposed to do. And, and so for me, that coupled with my experience with the film you mentioned, my, my good friend Joe Vigiano, who passed away on 9-11 with his brother, um, you, you realize that being, being a hero, is, it's really just getting through the day and, and just often um, you know, it's not beating your chest and it's, it's not, it's not uh, dunk, dunking a basketball. I'm not throwing any arrows at any specific players. Please, nobody takes this out of context. Yeah. So saying who we view as, you know, heroes. It's really about how you just lead your day-to-day -day life and do your job and come home and take care of your family. Um, and, and again, as an observer, I'm not pretending I'm any hero. I am not. But as an observer, as that guy who's been fortunate enough to be able to, to ride in the seat and, and see other heroes, uh, to see real heroes, I have to tell you that that's, what I was trying to put into this film, take Richard's wonderful, beautiful book, and then put that 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 message through there, which is that you know what, J just getting through the day, man. That's just surviving. That's that's being a hero. Just making the right choice that has consequences for you. Um, to me, sometimes that's it takes sometimes it takes more courage to lean down and pet a cat than to foil a bank robber. Yeah, and the reason is simply that courage courage is always present in direct proportion to how much fear there is. Mm. When uh, somebody says to me, I'm a coward, I'm so scared. I say, it, first, there'd be something wrong with you if you weren't scared. And second, your, your bravery has to do with how you deal with this. Because there isn't any, but courage doesn't exist if there's no fear. Yeah. You either have foolishness, which looks like courage. Okay, watch me jump through this thing, you know. Because somebody's foolish enough to do it. Here, hold this beer, watch this. Yeah. And then there's real courage, which has to do with doing what you're supposed to do, even though you're terrified. That's you it. Some way to act decently in the face of that. I, I, I love that one of the, on a TV show I've worked on, Iron, uh, Ironside a few years ago, there was a wonderful, he's a wonderful human being. His name's Brian Anthony, he was a captain. Forgive me, Brian. I call him Captain America. Uh, I do not know what unit the Army was in. I know he did three tours. He went to West Point. And we were having a conversation one day, just the greatest guy, wonderful writer, wonderful human being. And we were talking about leading men. It, rather, I was constantly bugging him uh, for anecdotes and about leading men into battle, this and that. And, and he said something to me that has always resonated with me that I passed on to my kids, which is he said, you know, the, what, what they taught him at West Point is the worst thing you can do is instill fear in people and lead that way. 
because he said, when you go down, he said, when I go down in a battle, no one's going to take my place. No one's going to be prepared to lead. But if you build confidence and you build that teamwork and you build love and trust, that's how you lead. And it sounds so, so simple. But again, I think if you look at what's going on in, on, in, in America today, and I'm not trying to be overly um, preachy here, but, but my good friends in law enforcement, um, who I know are, are, are really, pardon the metaphor, the terrible pun here, who are under the gun, um, until you've sort of walked in those shoes and been out with them, I, I think it's really difficult for folks to judge them. And I think that the real courage is what the men and women in the military and the men and women in law enforcement first line uh, responders do every day, where we all get to just sit here and judge them and tweet, yeah. and go on Instagram and then go go on and watch Netflix and have our Nespresso. Um, yeah. and, and, and again, my long ass winded way of answering your question, that's what this film it for me was about was saying, hey, look, here's this one guy who's wrestling with his with his angel, not even his demon, right? He's wrestling and said it's yeah. right. It's like the story of the angel wrestling with God. What am I gonna what am I gonna do and the impact that it's that it's gonna have? Well I, I would I will just say that Recon, I mean it it's such a powerful movie and I want to thank you both. I mean Richard, I want to thank you for capturing this in a book and, and Robert for enduring 11 years i think sometimes people think well you know this is a new idea and i talked to one filmmaker it's like it took 20 years to get this thing off the ground you know um thank you thank it, you. it's it's so it, the, the commitment to get the story out mm -hmm. and i think that's the piece that people need to to remember too and it you know it falls you know it's time you know the 75th anniversary of the end of world war ii mm -hmm. you know it's based on these true events um really surrounding the mission of four American soldiers. And uh, I got to tell you that the guy from Boston just had me laughing. Um, <laughs> such a great character. Chris, Chris Rochu, he's a wonderful actor. He's on The Vampire Diaries, terrific kid, terrific actor. He just he just nailed it. And, and, and just quick, quick, quick story. I know we're running out of time. I cast him two days before we started filming. I could not fill that role because he was he was the Jewish character. I did not want him to be the stock cliche character and like I said earlier to Richard Neil Simon has written those characters to perfection I'm not Neil Simon and so we had such a hard time casting it Chris had two days to prepare for that role and he was just phenomenal all the guys were oh it, it's such a brilliant film and so Robert where can people see this I know it's coming out November 10th so please to our viewers where they can see it and pick it yeah, up so the best thing to do right now November 10th which is of course the eve of Veterans Day will be in over 400 theaters if you go to Adam tickets.com like are you done with your last interview no we're just now finishing up <laughs> At let me know okay let me we'll know once it. you're done and i'll call you back to your final interview okay hey welcome to VUCA. i just want to tell our audience you know this is recorded uh, yeah, you're on you're on video here richard you're on video richard but yeah. our audience is going to love this piece i love so. that it's the real thing so adam tickets.com and then the next day it will be on a uh, video on demand okay great perfect Perfect, perfect. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you both for taking the time. I'm going to encourage our listeners and our viewers, because this will go out to our podcast audience as well, that they mm -hmm. truly need to, you got to find Recon, you got to watch it, spend the time. You'll find that golden thread of courage, but also mercy. And I love that piece of mercy and how the film ends. I don't want to give it away. I just got to say that, you know, when you get to the, the end of the film and then you, that, the piece of the German soldier. Uh, yeah. 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 I, anyway, I, I'm, I'm queuing it up for our audience so that they know that they want to watch this thing. Yeah. What Michael's saying is make sure you stay when it goes to black and read the final crawl. Because you <laughs> have got to read the final words you have. Yeah. Gentlemen, I want to thank you both for being on the show. Thank you for your service, Michael. Pleasure. It was a good, pl a wonderful pleasure.